What does it all mean? One brother was indicating to me, what kind of a title is that? You can talk about anything you want. Well, brethren, uh, important to that title is, what is the it all? Now, uh, Brother Johnson wrote uh, an article by that title, What Does It All Mean? in a 1925 Present Truth. He reprinted that article in E. Volume 5, a miscellany, chapter 1, in, that was uh, entitled, Science of the Times Among Truth People. Uh, that book was published in 1938. And Brother Jolly reprinted that same article in a Present Truth 1952 article. Now, uh, what I'd like to do for the first part of my discourse is give a summary of what that article entails. And uh, there's a, a great deal of epiphany truth in that article. And it ties in quite well with the fact that this is uh, a memorial service to brothers Russell, Johnson, and Jolly. And so this article begins by saying that there were very peculiar, very strange events that followed Pastor Russell's death in 1916. We know that up until his death and for a short time after his death, there was peace amongst the brethren. They all saw eye to eye when it came to the truth. But following his death, shortly thereafter, everything changed. That peace was broken. That seeing of eye to eye was shattered. Because what happened is that some of the brethren repudiated the beliefs that they held dear to themselves when Brother Russell was alive. Not only did they repudiate some of those beliefs that they held, but they accepted errors in its place. Additionally, many set aside former practices that they held dear to themselves and instead replaced those practices that were instituted during Brother Russell's day by others' practices. We see that the spirit that they had was not the same amongst many. Particularly were those amongst the leaders, the pilgrims. How many fell at that time? Often due to pride. And instead of holding to their former beliefs and practices, started teaching errors and false practices instead. Some revolutionized against teachings, others revolutionized against the arrangements, and some revolutionized against both the teachings and the arrangements that had been in place up till the time of our former pastor's death. Some of those leaders formed other groups, separate 
from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And so many divisions were brought about. One leader forming one group, another leader forming another group. Now, Brother uh, Johnson points out that these peculiar events must be pictured in the Bible. And so we find that to be true, that those events and the meanings of those events are found in the scriptures. Now this particular article, What Does It All Mean?, brings out three particular main events that transpired after Brother Russell's death. The first great event was the separation of the Lord's people into two general divisions. And this began to be enacted in 1917. Now there were some hints before then that there was trouble ahead, but essentially it did not become outwardly manifest until 1917. Now the first group were those of the Lord's people who continued to adhere to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society under the usurpatory management of J.F. Rutherford who was the president of the society and his associates. And then the second group was the non-adherence to the society, or what we would say is the opposition, those who opposed Rutherford and his associates' usurpatory course, which began shortly after our pastor's death. Now this division began at the the Bible House, in, at that time at Bethel in New York, split the Bible House up, but then as was known, the news spread and eventually it divided the Lord's people amongst the entire world into two camps. There was about 30 to 40,000 brethren that stayed with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, and about 10,000 brethren who withdrew from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, being opposed to the course that the society was taking under Rutherford and his associates. Now, Brother Johnson what was the first truth, the first new truth or progressive or advancing truth that he brought out following Brother Russell's death? It was the picture of Elijah and Elisha. It was the picture of the antitypical Elijah and Elisha recorded in 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, he pointed out, and as we can see in 2 uh, Kings 2, that Elijah and Elisha, those two prophets, walked and talked together after they crossed the River Jordan. This continued until a fiery uh, chariot <laughs> with horses and horsemen, divided them, came between them. And so Brother Johnson pointed out to the brethren at that time who were perplexed by what was going on following Brother Russell's death, why are we going through these trials? That this picture pictures the separation of the peaceful fellowship of the Lord's people. 
which began in 1917. Now, as I indicated, the prophets were separated by fiery chariots and horses. And so this pictures the little flock on the one hand, and the rest of the consecrated on the other hand. Of course, Elijah pictures the little flock, and Elisha pictures the great company in the Washteller Bible in Tract Society. Essentially, we could say the little flock and the great company. Chariots in the scriptures picture organizations, and the chariot of Israel here pictures the Washteller Bible and Tract Society amongst the Lord's people. Fire, or fieriness, pictures trials. Horses picture secular or religious teachings. In this case, these horses, these fiery horses, picture the teachings of the society's president, Rutherford, and his associates that were deviating from the purity of the truth and the practices of the truth under Brother Russell. And the fact that they were fiery shows the trialsomeness that this brought upon all of the Lord's people at that time. Eventually, all of the Lord's people were affected. Now, the horsemen, the ones who drove the horses in the chariot, very finely pictures the management at that time of the Watchtower Bible Tract Society, Rutherford again and his associates. And so that was the first great event that was brought out by Brother Johnson that took place after Brother Russell's death that indeed was a very great comfort to Brother Jolly and the brethren who were perplexed at that time as to the course of the Watchtower Bible Tract Society. Rather, were forced out of that organization, and others left voluntarily. The second great event was the revolutions that took place against, again, the Lord's teachings and his arrangements that were given by the Lord through that faithful wise servant, Brother Russell. Now, uh, various leaders like Rutherford, who was a pilgrim, and other pilgrims and lesser leaders and their adherents <coughs> violated the truth and the arrangements and the spirit of the truth, which forced the faithful like Brother Johnson and others, like Brother Jolly, who was a prominent supporter of Brother Johnson, to resist this revolution that was taking place against the truth and the arrangements. It uh, originally began in Great Britain, and then it eventually spread to America. Again, the first inklings of this took place in 1916, but was outwardly manifested in 1917. An interesting read is about uh, Brother Johnson and his experiences when he went over to England. Of course, that was a trip that Brother Russell had arranged for him to take care of certain problems that were transpiring over in Great Britain. And uh, Brother Johnson, of course, uh, resisted some of these brethren who were uh, usurping some power that they shouldn't have. And uh, he was successful in that until he was recalled back to America by Rutherford. And of course, uh, that he had to then also resist Rutherford and his associates when he came back to America. And so uh, 
the little flock, the priesthood was led by Brother Johnson. He eventually, as we know, began the present truth in 1918. And he used the present truth really to bring forth again the advancing truth along the lines of Elijah and Elisha and revolutionism. And he refuted these errors and bad practices that were being brought out. And of course, he indicated that revolutionism is what was manifesting those who had lost their crown, who had become great company members. And so it wasn't revolutionism that caused one to lose their crown. Their crown had to have been lost before 1914. But it was revolutionism that manifested the Lord's judgment through Brother Johnson and others that such and such of an individual had lost his crown, who is now a great company member. And we've had this mentioned here, but we see the picture of Azazel's goat, or sometimes referred to as the scapegoat, in Leviticus 16, 20 through 22. Immediately after September 16th, 1914, A whole new work began. Instead of the little flock reaping, doing the reaping work, in other words, giving enough truth to brethren that would enable them to leave Babylon, they began the work, the attestatorial work of confessing Christendom's sins and the great company heard this. The world's high priest, Jesus and the little flock, began this important work that began at that time, and that continued until November of, of 1916, shortly after Brother Russell's death. And Brother Johnson explains that that was an indication as to who really was of the little flock, because those that faithfully performed that work of preaching, using especially Volume 4, the Battle of Armageddon, and showing the injustice of Christendom, and that Christendom was really guilty of bringing on World War II. They were taking a hypocritical course, you might say. And so all the faithful little flock proceeded with that work. And the gleaning still went on, but that was uh, the youthful worthies that carried on the work. Great company members, some may have started that work, but none of them went on to complete that work. But the faithful little flock members continued that work from the time they started until November of 1916. And so there was lectures going on throughout the country pointing out the sins of Christendom. And the antitypical goat, Zazel's goat, the scapegoat, heard antitypical Aaron, the little flock, performing this ministry. Well, in the type, you know that Azazel's goat was uh, tied up to the door of the tabernacle. And of course, he knew what was going on. The Lord's goat, uh, of course, he knew had been killed. And so uh, certainly it probably made him somewhat nervous, feeling he maybe had the same fate coming. <coughs> And so he tried very hard to struggle to get free from being tied up uh, to the uh, door of the tabernacle. Well, eventually, 
uh, the goat was loosened from the door of the tabernacle. He was untied. And uh, Azazel's goat, or the great company, the antitypical goat, what does this mean? Brother Johnson so nicely describes that that meant that the great company was given more freedom. Now, what kind of freedom were they given that they didn't have before? Well, as I mentioned, over in Great Britain, there was uh, several elders of the main class in London who really were uh, resisting Brother Russell's control over the London Tabernacle. And they even sent a letter to Brother Russell that uh, basically along the lines that they didn't feel that he should continue his control over the work of the London Tabernacle. Many elders, however, held to Brother Russell. But that was one reason why Brother uh, Russell sent Brother Johnson is to try to help clear up this. But that really gave some of these revolutionistic great company members uh, a little looser rein, a little more freedom, they felt. And the second means of gaining more liberty was when Pastor Russell died. He gained, he kept good control over the society up until his death. After his death, however, we know what happened, that then the revolutionists, sifters, took over the society. Again, it began in England. Brother Johnson and others resisted that goat. And of course, the goat was eventually brought to the gate of the court and handed over to the fit man. Of course, that pictures how eventually Brother Johnson and others had to withdraw priestly fellowship from these great company members. And uh, of course, this process, though it began in Great Britain, <coughs> and shortly after showed up in America, this same process. The third great event that took place then is in after Brother Russell's death was the division of the great company into many different groups, as we indicated. You recall that uh, we got Jacob, who one of his sons was Levi, and Levi had three sons, Kohath, Merari, and Gershom, according to Numbers 3, verse 17. All of these are typical. Of course, the three sons of Levi, Kohath, Merari, and Gershon, picture three different groups of Levites. The Kohathites, Merarites, and Gershonites. Now, going into detail, the Kohathite Levites had no wagons or chariots. The Merarites had four wagons or chariots. And the Gershonites had two wagons or chariots. Now, why is this important? Well, again, somewhat deeper epiphany truth, but wagons in the scriptures picture organizations. And so the <laughs> Kohathites had no earthly organizations. They had groups, but no organizations. <laughs> The Merarites were those who sought and gained control of the society. They had four wagons, four organizations. And the Gershonites were those who tried to gain control of the society, but were not able to. They eventually formed two organizations for their work. Now we see we're looking at the epiphany picture, but I think we all know that 
in the millennial age, there also will be these three Levitical groups. The Kohathites will picture the ancient worthies, the Merarites, the great company, and the Gershonites, the youthful worthies. But back to the Epiphany picture, Kohath had eight, uh, four sons, Merari had two, and Gershon had two. So there you've got, uh, under Levi, the three sons, and then you've got the eight grandsons. Now eventually, those grandsons had sons, and those sons had sons, so eventually there became 60 divisions of Levites, or antitypically, that means that the Levites and the Epiphany were divided into 60 different groups. We've heard of this 60 posts in the tabernacle picture. And one of the big questions that came up, uh, who's the 60th post? And Brother, of course, Jolly brought out that the 60th post were the good Levites, or the, the good, great company members, those who had the epiphany truth. They were associated at that time with the LHMM. But that was the 60th post. And I remember we used to talk about this uh, at the Bible House, and right now, e either they're all gone, these 60 groups, or they're almost all gone. The only ones that would be left would be perhaps some youth these who may be associated with some of these groups, but for the most part, they're probably practically gone at this point. Well, let us uh, take a look a, a little further here. When Brother Johnson died in 1950, Brother Jolly took over as the executive trustee of the Layman's Own Missionary Movement, and of course, he was the leader of the Lord's people. So by not election of the brethren, but by the Lord's appointment. Brother Johnson had pointed him out that he would be the leader of the great company and the youth for these, and eventually the consecrated Epiphany campers. But uh, what was the first truth that he brought out? It was the truth that the bride was complete, that the bride was married, and the marriage was complete according to Revelation 19, verse 7. But remember what we read in Revelation 19, verse 6, it brings out there would be mighty thunderings or mighty controversies. And indeed, true to form, as there was trouble after Brother Russell's death, there was trouble, there was trials, there was controversies after Brother Jolly's death. Brother Johnson. Or after Brother Johnson's death. Thank you, Brother. Yes. What were those trials after Brother Johnson's death? Well, some revolutionized against that truth that Brother Jolly brought out that the bride was complete. The bride was in glory. One said, the bride can't be complete. I'm still here. Oh, what pride. Brother Jolly talked to one brother, and the brother said, if I can't be in the little flock, I don't want anything. And what did Brother Jolly say to him? He said, that's exactly what you'll be if you don't change your attitude. Many had trouble accepting that they were not of the little flock, that the little flock was complete and they must then be great company members. Well, that continued, but there were more controversies. We know of two prominent youthful worthy sifters who rose up in the 1950s. A brother Hoffel and brother Cruzen, 
who were very prominent brethren. Hoffel was a pilgrim under Brother Johnson. In fact, he gave Brother Johnson's uh, sermon at Brother Johnson's death. And I heard the thought that he may very well have been the next leader after Brother Jolly died had he remained faithful. He was that prominent. He was one of the special helpers of uh, Brother Johnson. But he turned against the Lord, the truth, the brethren, and because he was very prominent, he uh, brought forth some very subtle errors. But Brother Jolly, who certainly, under the Lord, was able to see those errors and was forced to defend the truth against those errors that he brought out. Hoffel also, now he was not a pilgrim, he was uh, an evangelist, but he was very intelligent. He worked at the Bible House. Uh, Brother Hedden and I remember saying that uh, he liked him a great deal. He was a very capable brother. But apparently pride came to him and he also <coughs> became a sifter and revolutionized against the truth in the arrangements. Again, Brother Jolly had to defend the Lord, the truth, and the brethren against another prominent sister. And there were more that rose up. There was a Mr. Cater and others. Now, uh, going further then, and like we said, Brother Jolly, in these controversies, in defending the truth, brought out so much truth that we still have today. Brother Jolly eventually died in 1979. There wasn't a great deal of trial or controversy at that time, not certainly like it was after Brother Russell and Brother Johnson's death. Brother Galkey took over. He died in 1985. No particular trials or controversies. But it was different with Brother Hedman's death. <coughs> it became a trialsome and controversial time. A lot of controversy. Now, all of us who went through those times and have been through those times were quite perplexed with what was going on. What does it all mean? In hindsight, I think we can see it much more clearly now. That time was very similar to the time after Brother Russell's death, except on a much smaller scale. Aren't we thankful for the epiphany volumes we have that essentially showed us what was happening because it had happened before, after Brother Russell's death. Various truths and arrangements began to change, leading to a nearly worldwide division of the Epiphany Brethren, who had, until Brother Hedman's death, for the most part, had had wonderful unity. <coughs> And yet, the division started in again at the Bible House first, eventually became worldwide, especially in the United States, in Great Britain, in Poland, and in Germany, and to a lesser extent in other places. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society eventually became a sect, uh, you might say a denomination. The Layman's Home Missionary Movement eventually also became a sect. Now, the question comes up, are there 
faithful brethren in the LHMM? Yes. In the Watchtower Bible Tract Society, Brother Johnson pointed out, and Brother Jolly, there were faithful, hot, little flock members that stayed in the society until they died. And so the same in the LHMM. No doubt there's many faithful, consecrated brethren that are performing a certain work for the Lord there. One brother sent me an article one time, and it was said, Man, Movement, and Monument. Every <coughs> movement in the past, I'm thinking primarily of little plot movements, began with a man. Like Luther, let's take him for example. Then it became a movement, the Lutheran movement. But then, as you know, there were certain crown losers that perverted that good movement by a little flock member, a little flock star member, into a denomination or a sect and brought in certain errors. Now they still kept their stewardship doctrine of justification by faith, but it became a monument, a sect. You know, I got to thinking that Brother Russell was the star member who began the Parisian movement, and eventually after his death, it became a monument, it became a sect. Would we not think now that perhaps that could have happened to Brother Johnson and his movement? And indeed, that's what happened. He began that epiphany movement that was a good movement until uh, it eventually, in our day, has become a, a sect or a monument. What is the purpose of all of these experiences, dear brethren? For us, the Lord wants a tested and proven people. Our past trials prepare us for our future trials that we're about to face, which thankfully we don't know what they'll be. But one thing we know for sure is our trials are not over. There's more to come. Personal trials, perhaps controversies. There's works yet to be done to build up the Epiphany camp consisting of loyal, justified, and converted loyal Jews by the kingdom witness work that we're all hopefully performing, as well as many others. The brothers have taught falling world revolution and the destruction of Babylon. They predicted that millions will accept the truth message. We'll have to wait and see if that proves true of what they said. But the people will be more amenable at that time. Following Jacob's trouble phase two, Israel, after their deliverance, will be converted to Christ. Plus, the kingdom message that we're getting out and that our others are bringing out will better prepare the public, the world, to enter into the millennial camp when that opens up. They'll be better prepared to accept the restitution times. But brethren, that's our external work but our most important work, as you know, is the personal carrying out of our consecration in its seven aspects, in self and world denial, in watchfulness and prayer, in the study spread and practice of the truth, and in the faithful endurance of the incidental trials, sufferings, and persecutions that we face. and to help our brethren, one another, 
to carry out their consecration. We're particularly tested on faith, obedience, and I would add a third, love of the brethren. Ultimately, that is a test that we all have, are, and probably will continue to face. That's the third quarter mark of perfect love. We may not attain the love of enemies in this life, but it apparently is true that the Lord expects us to develop that disinterested love of the brethren. And so, brethren, the prospect before all of us is for the rest of the epiphany until the kingdom comes, the kingdom itself and the ages of glory beyond the kingdom in the little season certainly is glorious. We have a wonderful prospect before us. And so, may we all, and I include myself in this, may we all arise to the height of our privileges of consecration. And if we do, we're guaranteed that the Lord's favor will go with us. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. So may the Lord bless us all to that end. Amen.